All right. Uh, welcome back. This is week two of the web APIs with our book club from RPDS. Uh, this is a book that I am very much in the process of writing. And uh, this week, we're going to look at what I have changed in the introduction and then go on to the first real chapter where hopefully I'm going to uh, help you understand how to work with uh, the package hitter two to make API calls. So um, last week we looked at the introduction and then there were some, there was some great uh, feedback that I got and some stuff I had already been kind of thinking about changing and it led me to uh, split what was going to be the second chapter apart into it. Some of it came into the introduction and then some of it went into uh, what was going to be chapter three and then some of it's going to go into some other later chapters. So I ended up changing chapter two quite a lot uh, and hopefully for the better. So we'll see what people think. All right. So first, um, one thing I've done overall is I'm trying to kind of streamline the learning objectives into, for the most part, like the skill you're going to have at the end of this chapter or the skill I'm hoping you will have, skill or skills. And so it'll be a smaller set than what I had before. Um, and for this intro, I mean, it's not really much of a skill, but it's um, being able to uh, like explain what an API is. It's basically an introduction to APIs and then deciding whether this book is for you. Uh, last week, I did not have this um, definition of an API anywhere. And I realized that it would probably be good to have that right up front to help you decide if this book is for you. So. I think a little bit of this content was here, but most of it was not. It's only a couple of slides, but go through that. All right. Uh, so uh, this first section is what is an API? So an API, that stands for Application Programming Interface. Uh, here, an application is a function, a website, pretty much anything that a computer is doing. And then programming means it can be used in code an interface as in a way to interact with something. So altogether, that's uh, APIs allow computers to talk to one another. So uh, this book is web APIs with R. So what does the web part of that mean? mean? Well, technically any functions list of arguments is that functions API. And my favorite example of where this can be confusing right now is this is from the uh, hitter two website, like the very first sentence on the page is hitter two is a ground up rewrite of hitter that provides a pipeable API with an explicit request object that solves more problems felt by packages that wrap APIs. In that sentence, the first API means the interface to functions and the second API means the thing that this book is about. So this book is about web APIs and web API basically just means an API that's on the internet, something that you can access over the, the internet. Um, for the rest of this book, API means web API. Uh, there's, there's a chance that I use it some other way at some point, but um, we're gonna try to keep it to where API means web API, unless I say the API of this function or something like that. All right. And I can't, I don't think I went over these last week, but even if I did, I want to quickly go over some example APIs. So uh, an area that you will see APIs quite a bit is cloud services, like Amazon Web Services. R has a suite of packages uh, called Pause that is kind of all of the Amazon Web Services APIs. It's a whole collection of APIs. Um, there's also... Google, Google Cloud Platform, uh, Azure, uh, DigitalOcean, lots of different web services have um, APIs and usually those will have R packages to deal with them. Uh, lots of government agencies, both in the US uh, and internationally have APIs. Uh, one that I'm gonna use quite a bit to look at is the uh, Federal Election Commission API at OpenFEC. Um, a lot of agencies have APIs. Uh, there's an API for uh, finding like NIH, NIH grant information, I think, different things like that. 
Um, just there's random data APIs out there on the internet. One of my favorites to kind of demo with um, is this website, sunraysunset.io. And if you give it um, like latitude, longitude, and a date, it will tell you the sunrise, sunset, nautical twilight, civil, civil twilight, all these different times for that date in that place. Um, and so it can be useful uh, if you want to enrich a data set, you know, add a little bit of uh, like flavor to what does this time mean? Was it dark? Uh, that kind of thing. You can use that to, to help figure that out. Um, other just random services, I can't get away right now without mentioning OpenAI. Um, I'm explicitly not using OpenAI APIs in the demos in this book because uh, number one, they cost money. And number two, I want things that are likely to be the pretty much the same next year. And the open AI APIs are very likely to change uh, as things change with the company. And so uh, I will have, I'm, I'm thinking I'm gonna do like some blogs or videos or something separate from the book, just purely online content that deals with things like open AI, but for the book itself, I wanna stick to uh, things that are a little bit more stable. And then uh, kind of a meta uh, API is there's this APIs.guru. Uh, it calls itself Wikipedia of APIs, something like that. Um, this was actually down for a little while and that bothered me because this is a great um, way to search for APIs. There are other services out there, but this is one that's like free and open um, and is only concerned with uh, giving you APIs in this uh, in the standard format that we will uh, a little bit later in the book talk about. Um, so that is a great uh, directory to use. It's apis.guru is the URL, the website, or to reach the website. And as of Monday, when I updated these notes, or this part of these notes, um, it had about 2,500 APIs in the directory. Sorry, my dog's you know, barking in the other room, but uh, hopefully it won't be too bad. All right. Um, so that's that's the changes, the, the big changes to the uh, intro. Hold on a sec. Um, there's something that I haven't actually done yet, but I'm going to reference um, later. I start using uh, pipe and I realized, oh, that's a prerequisite that didn't go over. And so I will be adding a section to their introduction, making sure people are familiar with both the base R and um, Magritte pipe, because it's something that's going to be coming up a lot uh, within the book. Uh, but yeah, so that's chapter one. Um, are there any comments, questions before we go on to chapter two? Okay. So just one small comment. Sure. Um, I really should have watched last week's lecture, sorry. <laughs> um, but one thing that I'm excited to learn APIs for is like realizing that like almost every application I use has an API behind it that you could hit and customize somehow. Um, yes. So I don't know, just as, a, as that's one reason now that they're on my radar from you <laughs> that I'm not that you have to use it as an example, but just it's not that you have to go into any of that, but as an example of why you would want to, if you just wanted to add one so, more, because I feel like that's a whole class of APIs that could be fun. Yeah, that is, um, that's a good call. I, I had an early draft of what would be chapter one of the book. And then I stopped working on it because I got the advice of, Hey, your intro is going to change 400 times before you finish the book. Um, so get more of the book done before you try to write the intro. But I do want to really go into the fact that like everything has an API. Everything is an, like every web page is kind of an API. Um, and so, yes, like um, I've been uh, playing, like I have um, turning my filter on my swimming pool on, it's like, it has an app on my phone and I did a little digging and yup, it has an API that I could uh, access if I 
really wanted to. And so like pretty much everything has an API. If it's, especially if it's a, on your phone or if it's on the web, then it's connecting to the internet and it's probably calling an API. Sometimes it's private, sometimes it's public, but uh, we will talk about that. There's a chapter about finding APIs and I'll definitely be getting into that kind of stuff more. Uh, I can't remember the number right now. Well, and the number may change. So <laughs> but it's seven or so. Um, at that point, uh, by that point, and actually before that, if you want to send me any that you are interested in, I would love to see what people are playing with or would like to play with uh, because, you know, they could make interesting examples. Okay, cool. Looking forward to it. All right. Okay, so uh, chapter two of the book is now this chapter, how can I access APIs from R? Um, when we talked last week, this was chapter three, but I cut out, I had a whole chapter like about what APIs are. And I realized put a little bit of that in the intro, put some of that in here, some of the more detail or like deeper things into later chapters, because I want to really get right into using APIs. And so that leads to the learning objectives for this chapter. Um, when you finish, uh, or after we finish this chapter, we'll be able to fetch data from an API with hitter two, and we'll be able to build a hitter two request piece by piece. Um, these won't cover like every possible API and it won't cover even every um, aspect of some APIs if it has uh, talk about different methods, but fetching data, we're gonna have that uh, hopefully down by the end of this chapter, basics. Um, I wanna say before we dive in that I'm having trouble deciding on the order of this chapter and like whether I have cut things in the right places. I have, like I said in the um, channel, I feel like I've basically completely reorganized this area of the book about five times in the last few days. Um, but I think I think I like where I landed, um, but like I won't be offended if anyone's like, ooh, that didn't make sense or that felt disjointed or anything like that. Um, the only package we use in this chapter is hitter two. Uh, I don't even, yeah, I don't use any tidyverse functions or anything. I just use hitter two in this chapter. So I've said it a lot. What is hitter two? Um, we'll dig into what the letters mean in um, a couple of slides. But just for starters, I learned how to pronounce hitter two when they put this logo up on the uh, website for the package when they were approaching version 1.0. Uh, so I may slip into HTTR2 every once in a while, but officially the, the package is pronounced hitter two. So, okay. Let's start with just taking a quick look at what do hitter two calls look like? Um, Hitter2 is a rewrite of an older package called Hitter, and it's specifically re rewritten um, to use the concept of the pipe. And like I said, I'm going to add an intro for or a little bit about what the pipe is into the intro, um, because you do need to understand uh, the pipe in order to follow the code that I'm going to be showing. Um, but the, the short version is it's this, um, when you see these characters here, that is the base R pipe. And if you are reading the code, pronounce it as and then. Um, so we for this call, again, I'm, I'm gonna go into the details of how it works later, but I wanted to go into the general idea right away. Um, so this call, I'm, I'm trying to get some candidates out of this FEC API. Um, generally a hitter, pretty much always a hitter to request or hitter to pipeline is going to start with a request. You're saying, Hey, I want to hit this API. I'm going to request something from this API. And then you do some various things and we're, we're going to these details a little bit to, to modify that. I am saying here that I want to use the candidates portion of this API and I'm going to give it some, um, parameters. Once you've set up that request, 
you perform it. So there's the rec perform function, and that's literally just you know perform the request. Um, and then once we and sorry, that's where we actually hit the server. So when we call that function, we're saying, hey, actually go do something, get data. Uh, and then we come back and we will do a resp function of some sort, generally a resp body JSON in this case is saying, hey, we got back JSON, uh, pull that out of the response object and give it to me in R so I can work with it. Um, this is, uh, like I said, that uh, I will go into these in detail later. All the RESP stuff actually have their own chapter a little bit later, um, I think in two chapters from now. Um, for now, just, you know, it is just, we're getting something back. That's all we need to know at this point. Uh, you're, you're getting an R object. Was that on purpose? Nope, I think you accidentally were unmuted. Okay, um, so we're getting an R object. We'll dig into how to kind of go through that object later, but all right, we're getting a thing. We have done it. We've we've made a call, uh, and we're able to get data back. Um, so that's what they look like. Like I said, we're gonna dig in a little bit deeper, but hopefully that shows you like this. It's this just logical pipe pipeline. You're going through piece by piece, building up your call, forming your call, parsing your call. So you might be wondering. Why is it called hitter and hitter two? What is this HTTR nonsense? Well, that comes from uh, the HTTP, which you may have seen like in um, web addresses, also known as URLs. Uh, HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. So, okay, what is that? Well, hypertext means web content. Um, originally, that meant text and links. Uh, if you've seen like .html on the name of a file on the internet, uh, that is hypertext markup language. So that's the original content, but really now it can mean images, videos, just data, uh, that JSON format that I mentioned, all kinds of different things that are on the web. So that's the hypertext part. Transfer as in exchange or move. So, uh, you know, just moving things around on the internet. And then protocol means it's rules. So HTTP is rules for exchanging web content. Uh, HTTP and HTTPS, where the S means secure, that's most of the internet. Uh, most internet communication is over this protocol. Uh, so therefore, hitter and hitter two deal with most of the stuff that's out there on the internet. It is most um, in chapter uh, seven or eight or somewhere in there, we're going to get into some of the other options of what APIs might use, but for probably almost everything you work with, um, and possibly everything you work with on the internet, when you're trying to hit an API, it'll be using HTTP or H more like the HTTPS. All right. So that leaves us why the two. So it's HTTP and R take two. Um, this package, both of these packages actually are by written by Hadley Wickham, um, the same guy who did, you know, uh, R for DS and a bunch of other books and the Tidyverse, and he uh, works at Posit. Um, and he wanted to completely rewrite HTTR. Um, I'm going to come back to your question or your comment in a second, Gabby, because you're not wrong. Um, so I, I do want to uh, stop and think, though, like, you know, why if he wants to make it better, he's like, oh, the, I really wish that I had done some things differently. Does anyone have any guesses of why he had to just rewrite? He couldn't just fix hitter as it was. I won't force anyone to come up. Oh, go ahead, Kevin. Oh, uh, just too many people use it. And yeah. You don't want to break things. So yeah, this is a screenshot from Monday of the uh, packages on CRAN and Bioconductor that depend on hitter. And so 
he couldn't just fundamentally change how a hitter works because it would break all of these packages. Um, and so because of that, he rewrote it as hitter two. It is um, a different approach to how things work. It's meant to work with the pipes and it's uh, really like uh, clean. If, if you are starting now, I just, you know, obviously, because this is what we're doing, but I strongly recommend just focus on hitter two. It's a much better way to work with things. Um, but hitter one is out there or hitter without the one is out there with lots of other packages. And I do want to pause for a second to actually read through all of uh, Gabby's comment here. So she, um, that she, she commented on, it would help to have a, a section on what type of problems um, the APIs can solve. Why do they exist? Um, yeah, that is a very good point. So I think the next time I go through that section where I just list some APIs, I think I'll dig deeper into and why do they exist and what do you do with them? And I think that will help. Um, I also do plan, I do it a little bit in here, but I'm, I'm going to try to do a couple of kind of projects that I'm building up throughout the book the um so you can see you know why i could use this api and how i can interact with it to um you know maybe in uh a main use for r would be i've got a data set and i want to add uh, i want to you know convert a um address to a latitude and longitude that would be that is a very common use for um apis or i have latitude and longitude and i want to get a little bit more information about like something, you know, uh, what time zone that is in or something like that. And so, uh, yeah, that's a good point. I will expand those out a bit in the next take. All right. So he couldn't just uh, rewrite or, you know, change hitter. So hitter two, let's take a look at how hitter two works like how it thinks and we saw a little gl glimpse of that i just want to go through this um a little bit more in depth and and walk through why it works how it works um and so the the first like important idea about hitter two is that all these rec functions that it has uh they return hitter two request objects and any of those hitter two request objects are like ready to uh, you can you can perform a request at them and they're the same like type of object we'll dig into that a little bit more deeper but it's important to kind of to see this and i'm hoping i'm going to cycle through it a few times but hoping that we can get to where it'll make sense why you want to do things this way so uh imagine you know we're gonna throughout this project or this chapter kind of be looking at this FEC API, API from the Federal Elections Commission. And in a real use case, if I'm working with that API, chances are I, I'm not going to just hit it once. I'm going to be getting various things from it. I'm, or maybe over the course of a project, I'll be repeatedly looking up different things from it. And so something you can do with Hitter is I'm going to create an object that is this request to just the base of the FEC API. And it's just, you know, it's it's just this space URL. It's not the full call. It's just the 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 beginning. And then, for example, and again, I'm gonna go through the specifics as uh, a couple more times, really, but I could just I can add authorization onto authentication onto that call. So this rec FEC auth, it has this API key that the my credentials built into it. And this object now is the API with authentication. And I can use that object to uh, set up a call to this candidate's portion of the API. If I want to get information about candidates, this rec candidates holds the path to that API. It holds the home you know, URL of the API, and it has the authentication all built into this one thing. And so then I can reuse that object to, oh, I want candidates from 2024. I just add 2024 onto this call. 
and I can perform it and get data back. And I can use that same object and just change it to 2022 and get some data back. And so this rec candidates becomes a reusable like connection to the API. Uh, or I can go back further, go back to this authorization. And instead of going to the calendars and or candidates endpoint, go to the calendar endpoint. And I'm sorry, I didn't define that. An endpoint is just like a portion of an API, a, a, a endpoint, a, a place that you're pointing at on the in the API. And so I can go to this other API, other endpoint, but start from um, a mostly ready to go call. That's really like the concept of Hitter 2. It's why he rewrote it so that you have these reusable pieces. Yeah. In the older uh, or other packages, you basically have to start from scratch every time you're making a call. Uh, and it's just more of a pain. Um, if you do want to use this API, by the way, I'm going to be going through it. You know, in the book, I'll have more detailed instructions on this, but you can go to, uh, oh, actually, nope, that's not supposed to be there. Uh, there's another, um, hmm, it's interesting, but there's a, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. I don't know why that's still in my notes. I'm going to actually reload the slides because I think this might be the yeah. version. Um, yep, that was, <laughs> that was a previous version. All right, so step back through there. So, um, I just want to like, you know, pause, uh, in case anyone has any questions, is the concept making sense? Um, Again, I'm gonna like I'm going I'm circling through these a few times because I think it's really important to see this, but it's that you can build these requests up piece by piece, and then uh, you have reusable things that you can keep. You can do almost the same thing. Um, Kevin, I see you came up on mute. Yeah, uh, I guess it's just a question about like. Um, so I think I get the the layering uh, aspect of. You know, adding another like piping in another uh, parameter or something, but specifically with like the parameters, you like, you can add like a named list or something, right? Like all at once for a bunch of parameters, or um, like is it best practice to like layer a bunch of things on top of each other? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, yes. So that's a good that's a good question. Um, and I need to pull up my notepad. Say um. Yes, you absolutely can do a bunch of them all at once. And um, here I am only, I happen to only be doing one, but you know, you could in these uh, calls, actually, we'll, we'll go into this more when we get into those specific functions, mm -hmm. um, but I don't explicitly show that right now. So I'll make sure I uh, add that uh, in the next iteration, but that is a good point. And it's good to see like how to do you can do either way. And actually I do show that a little bit. So we'll we'll come to that in just a sec. So I'm gonna go ahead um, and move on. And this is something, so this next thing, um, we're gonna look at how do I fetch data with hitter two. Um, this, uh, oops, how can I quickly translate API docs? So this was something I just learned about uh, recently, and I, I think maybe actually I'm going to end up putting it earlier in this chapter, like the first time we look at the call so that we can kind of get a better view of what we're doing. But um, this is where uh, I'm, I'm looking at this FEC API. You can go to this URL. Uh, I'll go ahead and paste it in the chat in case anyone's following along and wants to pull it up. Um, this is like the documentation for this API. They also have instructions there if you want to set up an API key yeah. instead of just using the demo key that I'm using. Um, yeah. And so if you want to like actually work with this API, you would need to go here. And within the docs, within almost any API docs, they have a spot where you can like try it out. Um, and they'll, they'll have like a block that shows this command line curl where it's just weird, you know, uh, stuff that you would put into a command line to make these calls. And it's usually, it always feels like, well, this is for other developers, not for those of us using R. 
but they added this thing in hitter two that uh, lets you get started really quickly. So you can take that curl block and just copy it into this function curl translate. So this is an example of what that block would look like. It's got this curl dash x get and slash and then a URL that's calling. In this case of the example that I was working with, the URL was quite a bit more uh, more complicated. I cut some things out of it just for ease of use on slides. Uh, but you know, it, whatever it is, you can just copy and paste it in there. And what this function gives you is the code to use in order to hit to do like what you did in the in the documentation. So I had gone into the documentation. Um, I just left the, I, I told it to use the default demo key or API key that it told me I could use within the documentation. I said, I want to uh, look at house races. And so it um, threw the office equals H in there and we'll look at some other parameters that we could have done. And it just, it builds our call. And so, okay, technically, um, and yes, as Kevin says in the chat, that, that translation is really cool. I very much agree. Um, technically, you know, we're done, I guess. Like, okay, that, that works. But this code is not, um, you know, it's not in the nice, purely clean, reusable format. And I, I want you to actually understand what it is. And so we're going to dig into it a little bit more. But that is code that will, you can call that and it'll give you a list of, or it will uh, give you an object from which you can extract um, the house uh people running for the house in 20 or ever actually, because I didn't put a year on there. Well, that technically it'll only be one page of those and we'll get into that in a later chapter, but um, that's the, yes. So um, Umer or Umar uh, said that this is so cool. Often the docs are incomplete and this would help a lot. Exactly that, you know, they usually have this try it out thing. And it's really nice that um, we can use that now Usually within the try it out, uh, or a lot of times it'll show like curl or command line or something like that. And then it'll have like Python, J uh, JavaScript. And it of course doesn't have an R tab, but now we don't need an R tab because we can just use the curl. So uh, this function is very cool. I like that this exists, but all that said, it does give you, um, like I cut some of the extra crap that it put in that isn't actually useful. And uh, it, Actually, in this, ex ex well, I cut out some of the curl command so that it didn't um, parse it. You'll get extra things that you don't care about. And so I want to walk through and learn what these pieces mean so that we can uh, clean these up and, and so that you don't have to go back into the docs every time. And, okay, now what would the call look like for this other thing? So, all right, so let's dive in. Uh, the first pair of functions that we want to think about our you know request which we've seen quite a lot and then rec path append and we'll talk about why it's exactly those ones uh but the you know thing that we've kind of seen a few times now is that hitter two thinks in these pieces of the uh the url so i like to take this this piece which is like this is the repeated piece of the api uh URL, it, it's in every call. Uh, if you experiment into the docs, every one of them will have this, you know, this URL with slash V1. And then we can take that. So that's our baseline and we can add the candidates path on. Notice that I'm using this. Well, I guess the first thing to notice is that um, this object that we created, the URL in it, it put the slashes in automatically. So we, we gave it this without a slash at the end, and we gave it with a, without a slash at the beginning and put one in. You can also give it more parts. Oh, and I guess I'm pointing at the wrong um, screen. Sorry about that. You can um, give it, like we could have given it more parts and it would just add them together with slashes all the way down on the end. Uh, that is really uh, helpful. But one thing to know is that, um, you know, notice that a URL is kind of naturally broken into these pieces where you've got the HTTPS. We said that's the protocol. We have the main URL, and then we have things after slashes. 
there's a function in in hitter two called rec earl path instead of rec earl path append i want you to know about it so that you can avoid it you probably never want rec earl path uh so if we had done that so if we take this the same starting object that had the url slash v1 and we rec earl path candidates this is what we get and I'll pull up, this is what I got, um, you know, the real one, the good one that I did. Notice that in the record old path, we lost, oops, sorry, we lost slash V1. Um, I just wanted to bring this one up so that you know to avoid. You want rec URL path append, like I think probably all of the time. Uh, it exists for completeness and like there might be some cases where you're starting kind of in the middle of things and then you want to back, be able to back back out and start over but you don't want this function and notably uh this function in that it's in a shared help doc within hitter two and there are no examples of its use within the help doc because it's like well this one has to exist but there's no legitimate use that they want to show um so anyway, wanted to call that out. Don't don't use record path. The next piece is it showed us this uh, rec method get, and the important thing to know for quite a while is you don't need this. Uh, the default for hitter two is get, and so you don't need to tell it that you're using get. It's going to use get. Um, so. It put that in automatically, but we don't actually need to think about this until uh, what's now chapter six. Um, it will be automated and we don't need, we rarely will need anything other than get or the other one that it can automatically detect, which we'll get to uh, again in later chapter. So I should probably put a thing in here. So at this point I've taken this first line, I'm sorry, this first line, split it in, into two pieces to make it a little bit clearer what we're doing. Gotten rid of this line. So now we're, let's move on to this query, rec URL query it gave us. In an AP or in a URL, a query is anything from the question mark and to the end basically of the URL. So here we have question mark API key equals demo and office equals H and uh, the the automatic thing told us that that means uh, that we're going to have this rec URL query call with uh, API key equals demo and office equals H. So um, these are just the arguments for whatever we're doing. So this endpoint is rec candidates, and we want to add on to it some arguments, API key and office. Now you can also do this um, piecewise, you know, like we showed uh, in another step that actually Kevin was asking about. So you can do it all at once or you can do it piecewise. Um, and in this case, I actually would encourage doing it piecewise because you can even do these URL query uh, parameters before you have a path. And for this particular API, there's always this API key parameter that you want in every single call you make to this API. And so you can put that right onto our like root rec FEC. We can add that demo key onto it. And again, like I was talking about before, now every call we make with this already has the authentication done and we don't have to add that every time it's done. It's all, all handled. Uh, so then we can, you know, take that authentication thing and add the candidates endpoint onto it. Um, and then we can take that candidates endpoint and add the URL query uh, parameter onto it. And again, technically each of these steps, you know, you, you can just think of as their own pipe. I'm calling them out as their own objects so that we can refer to them basically. And you might, depending on what you're doing, also want to make these separate objects that are then reusable. And just to kind of prove it that Building it up this piecewise versus building it up all at once, uh, they are exactly the same thing. They're generating the same code. Um, one thing to just know about, um, if I had put office before API key, it would have put it that way in the URL. APIs 
I think never care about that for the most part. I can't say, I guess I can't say never, but they probably <laughs> won't care about that. It usually doesn't matter. But if we we're just trying to compare the string of the URLs, uh, that can make a difference. So just so you know, it's not going to do anything uh, fancy to put those in a different order for you. All right. Um, something useful that was added like very recently in hitter two, right before it went to 1.0, uh, rec URL query has an argument dot multi. So often APIs don't want you to send uh, more than one parameter with the same name into the API. So that argument, you know, like um, office, for example, we might try to say office equals house or senate. Um, and by default, hitter two is going to throw an error for that. It's saying, uh, no, APIs generally don't want you to do that. Sometimes they'll take the second one if you uh, put in two and it'll just be confusing to you. And so it throws an error. It wants you to, uh, you know, it says it has to be length one. So any argument has to be length one, but you can use this dot multi to choose a strategy for handling errors, handling vectors rather. And this can be useful because, oh, and sorry, just it's dot multi, uh, they, the parameter is dot multi because again, these can be anything. They're whatever the API is asking for. And so they just put that dot there to try to avoid collision with a parameter that's named multi. But we can put this in and you know we could say like multi equals pipe is one of the options that you can give it. And when you do that, it puts in uh, your two values that you gave it separated by a pipe and it'll automatically string any number of them together for that office uh, parameter. It also has an option comma, same idea. It uh, strings them together, comma separated. Or, and this is what this particular API actually wants, is there's the value explode, which will take it and split it off into separate copies of that same parameter. The parameter docs should tell you which of these, if any, it wants, if it's going to accept multiples. Um, so it's nice to be able to do this automatically. Uh, the previous version of even hitter two uh, just wouldn't let you do this. Um, you would have to do all the pasting yourself, basically, and it was easy to screw things up. And so it's really nice that they added this in. Right. And so John, that, oh, go ahead. That's really helpful, but um, is one of these more common? I mean, I was trying to follow along on the site, and it took me, even though you went through it, like a while to find that curl. Um, I mean, it's there. Yeah. I'm not saying it's actually hard, but is one of these the ones you reach for first, and then just see if you get results for both <laughs> back? Or um, I think you dig for ducks. I um. I would probably try comma first and it, it wouldn't probably wouldn't like depending what you're doing it probably doesn't hurt to just try all three uh one after the other until one works but yeah, it can okay. be hard to tell that it worked sometimes sure like if your data won't necessarily have both values right or if it might like sometimes it'll just fail silently and it'll just give you all of the data that it has um yeah. So we will be talking later, I think, uh, about kind of how to read. There's documentation behind the documentation usually. There's a standard format that some APIs use that um, if they use that or if their API is available in this specification, it will explicitly say like explode for this parameter. Um, okay. So yeah, it's... I do need to probably, I, that's a good call that I should show the documentation side by side as we go through this and kind of how you can figure this out. Um, I'm going to make a note of that actually. Yeah, it's like clear that from the FEC example that like there's some very standard things, but when you're looking at it for the first time or close to the first time, it still feels yeah. like a lot. It, I mean, part of what I guess I, I need to um, help get through, like 
help you deal with is that it will be a lot. Like <laughs> uh, APIs are there. There's a initiative to standardize how APIs are documented, but it is semi successful. Um, it they are working on version four of that spec, and I would say it, it, like of the ones that use the shared spec, like 75% use version two, uh, which was quite a bit different than version three, which is the current one and version four is coming soon. So um, like that, that is a thing you'll have to deal with is that by their nature, every API is made by some team, like it's made by somebody else. And you may or may not uh, have an easy thing to work with. But I, I will say like that curl translate, that is a big, big win. It, it can't do like a hundred percent of if they do something really weird in their curl call, um, it's probably not going to succeed at translating it, but I, I haven't found one yet that it can't do. Um, and that will get you a long ways. And then you can take that. And if you can understand these like pieces of how to string things together, you can translate what it puts out and make it better and easier to work with. Uh, or, or, you know, like I said, you can just use it um, if you're making one call to the API. But the whole idea here is probably you're going to make more than one call. Um, and let's pull out the pieces and figure it out. So that's what I have for this chapter. I kept re-splitting and re-combining, but um, I feel like this is the logical place for this chapter. And I have, so the, the, I have several, I have four more chapters that are specifically about working with hitter two. Uh, the next chapter that we're gonna look at is uh, how do I tell the API who I am? This is all about authentication and other headers that you can include. Um, I definitely think that it deserves its own chapter. It's too much to just glom on to this one, but it's very important. And so that's why we're doing that one next. Almost every, like there are a small number of free open APIs, but most APIs, even when they're free, want to know who's using them. So you have to do some sort of authentication to say, hey, uh, you know, I'm John the Geek at gmail.com or whatever, and it will uh, then work for you from there. All right. Chapter four How can I process API, API responses? That's where we're going to go through. Uh, that RESP body JSON that I just very briefly showed is parsing uh, the data that comes back and uh, the step past that of, okay, you took this nested list or you took this nested JSON and made a nested list that I still can't work with. Uh, that chapter is going to dig into like how to make the data that comes back usable. Also how to deal with like images that come back or videos or whatever else you might be fetching from an API. Chapter five, how can I get a lot of data from an API? I think this is going to be important to a lot of our use of APIs. So even this one that I've been showing as an example, we're actually only getting the first 20 house candidates when we call it, because it uses something called pagination to um, like split up the response that it's sending. And uh, Hitter2 has a whole thing built into it to where you can... Um, tell it, okay, I want the next page and the next page and the next page and it'll automatically go through and you can uh, get all of the responses back in one call basically. And then chapter six is the new chapter. How can I do with other things with APIs? So this is things other than fetching data. If you want to um, notably like create a record in some APIs, uh, that is a whole other process that you'll need to do. You'll have to add some more stuff onto your request. Uh, and that's where we get into that rec method. And uh, even then you probably don't need rec method, but uh, for a few cases you will. Um, so yeah, that is chapter two. I have a survey and I, you know, thank you so often or so much for the, the comments you've given so far, but I do have a survey for uh, just how do you feel about this chapter? I know this is going to be weird because there's no book that you can refer to to see, okay, what did John mean by that? You can only really come to these slides. Um, but I want to know, like, how is it right now? It's, 
I know that this chapter will change a lot still before uh, the final version. But I want to know what you think right now. Um, it is, it's a complex, like getting into Hitter 2. I think once we're in it, then there's a lot we can do. But I, I want to try to get this introduction as clean as I can. Um, so yeah, any other, any comments, questions, um, ideas? Um, so we did, oh, I had a survey last week where we talked about, um, there were two options of, do we try to just kind of go through everything or, uh, is everyone open to the idea of we'll do the, you know, like this week we did chapter two. And the idea is next week we will do chapter two again with, I'll talk about any changes I've made based on feedback. And I'm going to um, write some like test yourself questions. I'm going to post those questions into the Slack and we'll go through the questions. Um, so that's, that was what you, I think unanimously everyone said, do it that way. Um, I, so that's what we will be doing. I'll, I, I don't think the questions are going to be like perfect yet, but I, I'm going to try to put together some, you know, here's an API. Uh, given what I told you in this chapter, can you use it? Um, in order to do this, this would be a great place of, if you have uh, an API you want to work with, give me homework of, hey, I want to be able to do this. And I'll make it a question of how do you do this? And I'll, I'll write it up and I'll write a solution and I'll do the whole thing. So um, otherwise, I'm probably going to mostly be working with a couple of uh, free open APIs for now. Um, that is something just throughout the course of this. I want to be collecting real examples of what people want to do with APIs because that's what I should build my questions out of. And I have some ideas, but they're things that I've wanted to do, and that's not necessarily what everyone else wants to do. Uh, so yeah, so I guess that is your immediate homework is if you have something that you want to do with an API, uh, send it to me on Slack, or I think I put a question in the survey that's basically, is there anything else that you want to talk about? Um, and you can put it in there too. Uh, did you have something to say, Rebecca? Yeah, so thank you for this. I was just going to say that um, APIs were really not on my radar until I knew you were making writing this. <laughs> um, so I have some things that I'll happily post in Slack that I have now become aware of like, oh, cool, I could use these if I knew how to. But since the scope of things is kind of an un unknown unknown, um, not having read through all 2,500 <laughs> APIs, I would also like it if you popped i mean i will happily publicly yeah. pop mine so other people can see what i think about but i think it's a cool thing to just the scope of the things that are out there that you can manipulate so i would i understand your willingness to to get yep. feedback for examples but i'd <laughs> also love to know what you were thinking about too uh, okay absolutely um another way to to look at it is um and again you know I'll also just be trying to find lots of examples of these, but if you have some data that you would like to uh, add to, like, hey, I or I've worked with addresses and I wanted to get the latitude and longitude, or I've worked with, you know, something and I've wanted to use that in order to to convert that to average temperature or you know whatever else you might have, I'll go do the legwork of finding an API that would do that. Um, so if you have, if you don't know, if you're a step back and you don't know the API you want, you just know that, oh, it'd be cool to be able to figure this out with my data. I know that in a lot of cases it will be, no, I just don't know what APIs can do. And so I need to give you some of that probably before you can get there. But um, I would encourage you to think that the answer to that question is kind of uh, anything. And so <laughs> um, if there's something you want to figure out, usually there's an API out there somewhere and you know at this point including you can make an api that will generate uh stories uh lies and and sometimes truth about uh whatever you might want to send into the api so um i probably will include a uh open ai 
example in this. Uh, that one won't be free to run, but it, well, it, it, I think we can keep it free, except me when I'm trying out 14 different or 14,000 different versions of it to try to get something that's cool. Um, that's the one that's hot right now, but there are there are lots of free APIs out there that you can do fun things with. Um, I'll probably also just go digging through the government, US government APIs, uh, because those ones are usually wide open and fairly stable. Um, oh, fitness tracker. Yes, a lot of the fitness ones. Um, I, I've also, so the other one. I'll yes, travel was on my list. <laughs> yeah. Um, Duolingo has an undocumented API. And so that's another one that I might uh, play around with just because I'm a Duolingo addict. So that could be uh, fun to look into. What, um, is that, what does that even mean? Like, how do you know what's there if it's not documented? <laughs> well, so it's not officially documented, but people, it, there are ways that you can, um, and again, I'm going to do this in a later chapter. You can look at your, like web traffic in your browser and see, oh, it's hitting this this URL uh, with these different parameters. So um, that is an API that exists. And then there are tools that people have made that basically you just go and click around on a website and it figures out what the API is that that website is calling. Um, a lot of times those auto-generated things are pretty bad, but the Duolingo one looked like some people had put some time into like figuring out, okay, what are the different endpoints that you can use to get your uh, information or you know various things? Um, I just saw that it exists. I haven't really played played with that one, but that's an example. Uh, I have a personal goal of actually like finishing the Spanish course that I've been very slowly going through on Duolingo. In the next year and so i want to get my data to to give myself a dashboard basically of am i on track do i have to move faster um and so <laughs> see a <Ace> bird up uh <laughs> um but yeah so i want to uh i want to have that as an example um but anything like, I don't know, fitness trackers are probably a really good one. That's one that a lot of people have. Uh, I should probably dig into, um, like, I think Spotify has an API where you can get your own data. And so things like that, that people want to play with. Like, I know they do their wrapped thing, but you can also make your own wrapped at any time if you want to. So um, some things like that, that anyone can have access to, at least, I think I, I will play around with as examples. Um, but yeah, if you have anything like um, anything that would actually be useful to you for work that you're doing, <laughs> that would be really cool. Like I can help you with it and then uh, cool it turned into an example for me. So um, I'll presumably like, I'm going to put some uh, Slack and YouTube and Zoom type stuff in there too, because that's the APIs that I use. Uh, I'm, literally, I'm using them every day, whether I'm actually typing the code or not. There's uh, stuff that runs for R4DS uh, that is hitting those APIs. And so I'll also use those as examples. But um, I think, okay, Slack definitely has some that we we have enough information to work with. I think YouTube is all like post stuff that we'll do in chapter six. Um, oh, the NOAA API for, yes, temperatures in various cities in the US. Awesome. Yes, that is a great example because that's one that like um, I want to, uh, oh, yeah, I'm going to call it, pull up some Tidy Tuesday data sets and show how you can make the data sets more interesting <laughs> um, by okay. using APIs. Like, Getting temperature values. If we gave you locations, um, maybe, yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> we'll look at how good it is. But uh, you know, you can add uh, temperatures to locations. I, the, I know about the um, sunrise sunset one because I did one where I was playing around with. Um, we had a tiny Tuesday data set that was UFO sightings, and um, wow. like it would. You know, an interesting data point on that is 
was this during the day or at night or like at dusk or what like what what was the light like when this sighting was made the sightings have a time and a date and a place and therefore you can use that to figure things out with the sunrise sunset api and so that's an example where you can enrich a data set using an api um and so yeah i'll probably i'll go through some of those and see what what do i wish this data had that's not there and then use apis for that uh but yeah real examples would be useful okay so john i can um, i know we're over the time limit here oh, but wow. um, yeah, well, yeah. so <laughs> i so yeah, the reason why i was hired for this postdoc that i have was that one of the data sets that we're using is human mobility data yeah, and for that we have to access this private um repository that this company has that we have to pay for and they have the api but i had to build oh my god it took me like a month to decipher because i've never done anything like this but i had to create the code to access the api i don't know if this is exactly what you're talking about right i yep. remember using json this was last year I remember using json i don't know if i use heater though but i needed to put like my password and all of that but it, it was like so difficult for me to figure it out hmm. and to be honest with you i don't even know how i did it because i don't <laughs> know if i could do it now <laughs> right but i have all my code and all of that and then because it was so much data i remember that i even created some parallel some some coding to do things in parallel so that all the downloading could be done uh with different cores in my, from my computer right so that it would be faster right um, but yeah, but I remember getting exactly the same with the NOAA, right? Like a lot of NA values that then I had to go into their website and manually download them so that I could have them. So I don't know if there's a way to put, I don't know if you're interested in my case. I can tell you more about it, like offline or something and yeah. show you how I did to access the data. But the other thing is maybe there could be a section in your book of, I don't know if this NA thing is because there's a problem in the connection. Can you solve it? Or is this just because the data is absent? Or right. you know what I mean? Is, it, was that a, a connection problem? Can you I don't know, not, like, troubleshoot? It's troubleshoot. unlikely to be a connection problem if you got a result back. Although, oh, you were doing some parallel stuff. So it could have been. It. Anyway, yes. Uh, that would be an interesting case to look at to see if I can get rid of some of those NAs. Um, there are things in here too, or you know, this is into the big data chapter of it has built in things for retrying uh, if it fails to connect or for just um, for doing. Uh, I don't think he built, oh, you know, he does have parallel. There's some parallel stuff built into it or two. Um, and so. I can like use that. That would almost certainly that'll be an example to use for that section where I'm, I'm going through how to use how to get massive amounts of data, um, where you have to hit the API over and over and over and over and over. Some of it is for sure um, how to do some data processing first to make sure you make as few calls as you can to the API. Uh, but you know it gets to a point where okay, and now I've got to make the calls. Like I can't do any more processing and now I need to actually hit it. Uh, I had that example for sure with uh, some of the sunrise sunset stuff I was trying to play with. Um, that <laughs> the that website basically is just this, it's someone's hobby, it looks like. And it has a, you know, don't make too many calls or something like that, but it's really vague on what is too much. And so I was trying to be careful really careful on not slamming his server when I was playing with it. So, um, but there are formal things that some APIs actually use where it will tell you to back off basically. And hitter two has stuff built in where you can automatically respect that and just slow, you know, stop making requests for 30 seconds or whatever it tells you to do. Um, anyway, so yes, I would love that example. I will, dig into it and see if we can use it. Um, it will be interesting for this first chapter 
actual examples. Um, we haven't done any authentication yet other than the really bad authentication of this API key that is in uh, this FPC thing. And I need to find more things like this that we know how to access them where they don't have any real authentication, uh, which that Sunrise Sunset is an example, but there are some other ones where you can get in for completely free. Um, oh, I'll do the APIs.guru. That's all, another one. That's the meta example because that's the API that you can use to find other APIs. Um, but yeah, anyway, so we need free examples. Next, that's why chapter three is about authentication because you can't do much of anything until you have authentication. All right, but yes, we with are Noah, over... oh, With Noah, ahead. you need authentic authentication, but it's free. Yeah. Because with NOAA, you need to register your email, but then in a second, you get the email yeah. like, yeah, you, you're, you're in, this is your password. It's probably the, the I, I think it's the same, it's actually the same one that F, the FEC uses. Um, so the FEC has a demo key that you can use or you can register, get your own key. Um, and it's with like data.gov. So it's a, a key that you can use all over the place. And yeah, it's mostly to, for getting, um, reducing bot usage. And also they, um, have probably have some automatic filters of uh, based on where you are. They probably stop certain countries from accessing the APIs, um, things like that. Well, and also you probably like sign some terms of service by using it or something by right. signing so up. So you're agreeing to something. And so, yeah, they can, they have a justification to cut you off at that point, um, things like that. And then once you're using a key, they can, uh, like they could cut off that one key if you're abusing it. And so um, even if it's easy, like they, it might be automatic to sign up, but then they can turn it off <laughs> after you've signed up. <laughs> and so, yeah, like if you have some automatic thing that's going, and then you would have to sign up again, you could, always could do that, but um, yeah, eventually they'll cut off your email address, I guess. Anyway, oh, I can stop the share. So yeah, all right. So I need to collect a bunch of examples and then make some um, some real simple exercises uh, just because there isn't that much that we've learned at this point, but we've got the basics and probably a few conceptual type of questions I wanna put in there. Um, and, uh, and it's gonna be interesting because you don't, like I said, you don't really have the book, but it, so any material you need to answer the questions will be in a combination of the slides and the hitter two docs probably and if not uh we'll talk about um you know what i need to write in order for the exercises to be answerable because it's this weird case right now where there is no actual book i mean there is but i haven't like this chap oh actually i have to update the book because the chapters are now out of sync because i changed the chapters yeah so we don't have access to what you have so far right um, well, you have access to everything that is fully written for the book is at wapir.io, but like I'm typing that in, but don't use it. <laughs> like it, I have done way more work on these slides than I have on the book. Um, I started writing parts of the book and that ended up actually, I think one of the chapters I was working on ended up. I'm not going to include it. Uh, and so that is why I was like, you know what? I'm going to focus on the slides. Slides are way easier to edit. Let's get these slides down, um, the order of them, all of that. And then I'll flush it out into the chapter. Um, but given that, that means some things that I just said aren't written down anywhere. Well, they're in the speaker notes. So technically, you can go on to the slides and hit S, and it gives you the speaker notes. And that shows you what what bullet points I had to uh, help, me, help me with. So if you need those when you're answering exercises, that will be there. And then speaker notes plus slides will, will become the book, uh, possibly a little bit this week and definitely more so next week. All right, so yeah, it's quarter after two. I need to go see uh, what my dogs are up to, so. <laughs>
I will Thanks. see you all on Slack. Thank you very much for being here and for some really Thanks, good John. questions. All right. Bye. Bye.